Welcome everybody to our special lunch and learn session. And um, before I invite Rabbi Saul to say a couple of words and uh, to introduce our special guest, allow me to ask the following. First thing, please make sure that you are muted so we can all hear our guest speaker clear, uh, loud and clear. The second thing is if you have a question while our guest speaker is uh, on his uh, uh, speaking, please put it in the chat box. I will monitor the questions and later on when we open the session for our Q&A, um, I'll call your name so you can uh, ask the question yourself or I will ask it on your behalf uh, if needed. Oh, and thank you all for joining us. And without further ado, uh, Rabbi Felicia Sol. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Hope everyone is doing well today. Um, we're really honored today to have uh, Dr. Moshe Habertal, Rabbi Moshe Habertal, uh, speaking with us uh, about the Israeli post-election. And um, I think many of us uh, are deeply concerned about uh, what is happening in uh post-election and with the election. And so whenever we're in a state of confusion and seeking uh, wise answers, uh, Dr. Moshe Habertal is uh, one of the people we turn to uh, to seek wisdom. Uh, Dr. Habertal has spoken to us many times at BJ, is a longtime friend of BJ, and we want to thank him for being with us and really um, obviously a good friend and invited him to be with us. So I'll just give a, a short introduction. Dr. Moshe Habertal is a professor of Jewish thought and philosophy at the Hebrew University and the Gruss Professor of Law at NYU. His latest book, Nachmanides, Law and Mysticism, was published by Yale University Press in 2020. He's a fellow at the Shalom Hartman Institute, and uh, he has many books, of course, and uh, is a uh, serves uh, as, a, as a voice of human rights and, and Jewish philosophy in so many different ways in, in terms of uh, is a sought after um, wise counsel. Um, and so we're so glad that he's with us today to give us that voice. Welcome. Good, thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation uh, for, uh, Rabbi Felicia and for uh, for the warm introduction, um, I this is this is really as 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 you mentioned in your introduction in a watershed moment for the history of the country for the history of Israel, and it's really a time uh, for many of us to first have a have an understanding of what is it exactly that that we are facing, what sort of crisis, what are the issues at stake, what is at stake. And understanding is an opening for, uh, for taking serious account on what can be done and what ought to be done. So I will start with what the things that I see at stake in this, this election, which is not a, a minor moment. It's a watershed moment in the history of Israel in many ways. And it involves four issues that I want to stress. And those issues will be essential if we want to understand what's happening and if we want to change or constructively affect reality. We have to have an insight on, on the reality we are in. And I want to frame what was at stake and what is at stake within uh, uh, four larger themes. The first thing is what I would call the turn or the ongoing turn, but this one is a moment of, of uh, crossing uh, from what I would call national liberalism to ultranationalism. And what do I mean by ultranationalism? What's the difference between national liberalism or national democracy to ultranationalism? You might call it populism, but I prefer ultranationalism. Nation states like Israel, like many other states, have, a, have an identity. 
and they have a Jewish identity in many ways. And that could work with liberal commitments as long, and this is where the watershed, the, the driving distinction between ultranationalism, liberal nationalism, is that for ultranationalism, the very identity, the very national identity of the state expressed in many ways, that very identity works as subordinating the minority of the ethnic or religious or racial minority into second class citizens. The national character of the state for the marginalized, subordinate minorities into second class citizens. And by the way, this is a test of all nation states, right? Because when when in the 90s of the of, of, of when the Soviet Union dismantled and we had we had an emerg emergence of, of Latvia or Estonia or Lithuania, Baltic states, they didn't form a, a binational state, a multi-ethnic state, they formed nation states. And those nation states with new, new minorities, in this case, Russian minorities, and, and those states will, will examine, will be tested by the place and status of minorities within the nation state. And what happened in this election is that the Netanyahu camp with the radical right ran on the following principle that the prior government of Bennett and Lapid was wrong, somehow betrayed Israel by sharing power with an Arab Israeli party. The issue at stake was, can Jewish, can the Jewish minority, majority share power, share power in government? with the Arab minority. And by the way, we had a, a very exceptional, unique party that was established by Arab citizens of Israel, led by Mansour Abbas in the prior government, and the thrust against this prior government in the propaganda, but not only propaganda, in the identity of the new coalition forces that now form the government is, we are not going to partner with Arabs in government. Why? Because they are designated as enemies. And the ultimate sign of ultranationalists is the enemy from within. There is an enemy inside. And we have seen this after a moment, a real moment of hope of partnership, of inclusion, that was broken and undermined by this coalition. And I would say it's a stain. It's a stain on the nation, on the nation state that prevents sharing power with minorities. And that's a moment I would say the moment of the emergence of the ultranationalist government. That's the first issue. I said I have four. I mean, I can talk about each of them for a long time, but I want to give a larger picture of what's at stake. But that's the first. The second one, which is not accidental, and it's tied to the first one, is that what ultranationalists do, if you see in Hungary, in Poland, other places where ultranationalism is emerging, is that they weaken systematically the institutions that are there to protect minority rights and their place in society. And that's that's what I mean by uh, by especially the power of the courts. Israel had a, a very powerful Supreme Court, very constructive in many ways. And this new government and, and, their, and their decisions and their legislative agenda is to weaken substantively the, the power of the court. And I wanna, I wanna explain uh, the actual 
the actual issues that are involved in that. And to this is a, an alarming moment in terms of the history of Israel. Um, the, we have a strong Supreme Court and the Supreme Court through the basic laws that Israel has, has a power of judicial review in which it can cancel laws that were legislated by the Knesset on the ground that they are in clash in conflict with basic laws such as human dignity and freedom and other basic laws. It gives the court constitutional power to override the Knesset in case the Knesset abrogates and, and violates human rights or minority rights. Now this Knesset is going to pass a law that it can <clears throat> override a judicial review by the court with a bare majority of 61. Right. So let's say, let's say the following scenario. Let's say that the, this, this Knesset will pass a law that will give subsidies to large families, but it would say, well, those large families that we're gonna subsidize are only Jewish families because the Arab families are, are not ours completely. And the Supreme Court naturally would say that's thoroughly discrimination. We are obligated to equality before the law of all citizens and it will strike down the, the, the law. The Knesset in a bare majority of 61 can override this, this decision and go ahead in its own legislation. Basically, given the fact that Israel is a fragile democracy, it's a democracy under threat from many pressures, by the way. Uh, um, this, this undermining of the court means undermining a, a very important institution, in a sense, the most important institution in protecting minority and human rights, allowing majorities a free reign of their ultranationalist fantasies and goals. That's the second issue. The third issue, uh, I said I want to mention four subjects that are at stake. The third issue is uh, <clears throat> the place of the ultra-right and its role in, uh, in this government in creating facts and directing the policies, Israeli policies in the West Bank in different areas. That includes settlement policy, it includes land confiscation, it includes, I would say even more, that's more subtle and more complexity, complex, an ongoing pressure of brutalization of Israel's armed forces, the IDF, the police, uh, uh, through claiming, which is a classical claim of the radical right, is that the human rights people, the people who care about justice, really tie the hands of the soldiers in their fight against terror and threats. And this is, we have to untie those hands, we have to put an end to, to, all, to those type of restrictions and creates different sort of rules of engagement that will allow a, a far more brutality and violence in applying force towards the, the Palestinian population in the West Bank. And that's very, very, very complicated. It, it, um, if we wanna go into details, uh, both Ben Gvir and, and Smotrich in the coalition agreement, in the, in the roles that they get. Ben Gvir was really um, uh, one of the ugly faces of Israel will become the, um, the minister of police or, or internal security. And by that he will gain control over policing among other things, the West Bank, but not only on the West Bank, also the uh, Arab citizens of Israel and other, other opposition or human rights activities within Israel. And I wanna say one thing that uh, happened in, in that regard in the, in the third aspect, within this third aspect, is that it's the first one in the history, first time in the history of Israel that uh, such voices became really, uh, uh, were legitimized as in some ways mainstream voices in the country. 
these voices were marginalized or kind of excommunicated in the political life of Israel and Netanyahu government really legitimized them, made them part of the system, an integral part of the system, giving them not trivial roles in, in managing, in managing, in, in being among the conflict. Here, I also want to raise within that third large issue, which contains different aspects of the conflict, I want to raise the issue of the Temple Mount and Harabait, Haram el Sharif. Uh, ben Gvir is known, not only Ben Gvir, the religious radical right, is known uh, in its aspiration to ferment tensions around Harabait. The whole idea of owning, being sovereign over Arabic, as if using using a perverse a perverse slogan, which is if it is holy to me, if it's sacred to me, it's mine. I have sovereignty over the place, and I think, and we are we that we are the students of the idea of kedusha, of sacredness, know very deeply that if there is a meaning to the idea of Kedusha and sacredness, is that if something is sacred to you, it's not yours. That's the whole point of the idea of the sacred, of the notion of the sacred. It's not yours, you don't own it. Now, I, I wanna say um, um, the whole, the whole um, use and abuse, abuse of Harabait, of the Temple Mount, as a political instrument is a risk to transform the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, which is a political conflict, into a Jewish-Islamic conflict, turning a political conflict into a religious war. And that means also, uh, among other things, making our Arab citizens, our brothers and sisters Arab citizens, by definition, under the pressure of joining this war, this, this conflict, this religious conflict as Muslims around the Temple Mount Haram al-Sharif, needless to say that involves Turkey and Indonesia and Muslims in India, it involves the whole Islamic world. So we have the third issue that has to do with uh, the larger implications on, of this uh, government and the results of the elections on uh, the way in which the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and the larger Jewish-Muslim relationships are going to be affected by mainstreaming, by becoming, by, by making the radical right of Israel as part of the mainstream of the government that we have. The fourth thing, in, my, in some ways the most painful for me as an Israeli, as a Jew. And it's the most complex to deal with and the, the most, the deepest and, and, and long-term thinking and struggle is the impact that this election has, this election, this trend, this way in which the, the language of a political life is being shaped the impact this has on, on the way Judaism is interpreted, understood, enacted within our country. Because we have, we have not only a struggle about the identity of Israel and its future as a Jewish democratic state, which is by the way, the ultimate problem that we are facing. There is no other problem geopolitically, no other problem more important than who we are as a country? What is the relationship between our national identity and our liberal democratic commitment? So we have a struggle. I mean, these elections is really a struggle about this issue. But there's another struggle underlying all of that, which is to the heart and soul of, of Judaism, of Yadut as a, as, a, as, a, as a force shaping our, our life as citizens as a country. And this is, um, uh, uh, and we are talking about um, uh, a breakdown of a certain sensibility, the Jewish sensibility, 
that sees um, that sees the equality of all humans as a god given as a god given assumption as a sacred obligations we have to each other jews non jews all created in the image of god and it's also a betrayal in in many ways not only the idea of the human and the sacredness of the human it's also a betrayal of our historical memory as a minority a minority that have seen the pain of ultranationalism and its ugly and its ugly results because one 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 thing that always happens when ultranationalists get in power is that they are they enact that type of policies that in some ways cause a justification to their politics which is well you discriminate against the minority by defining them as enemies of the state the enemy inside and then naturally they are the marginalized act in responding to that discrimination sometimes as well in violence which is a reason for further violence which becomes then a way of, of, of validating your policy or ultranational policy. We know that ugly cycle and that we Jews, the victims of that history, are enacting that while we are a majority, betraying our religious and historical commitments. That's a complex fourth dimension of what is at stake in these elections so i what i said i mean we i don't want to take too much time because i really want to engage in a conversation and this is just a, a beginning of a conversation what i'm trying to outline is what is at stake four aspects that are at stake here in 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 the in the in the election and um, maybe maybe i would for the sake of the discussion maybe i would stay with what is it what is it that has to be done because uh, because the last thing that we want is to surrender to that it's, it's too much important so much is at stake uh, and uh, to surrender to it and we have to think seriously where we, where we and i'm talking maybe the we here because you you we all us included it where did we fail and what has to be done and i would say i i i draw comfort from from the call from the awakening for action given that reality so I, I would I would leave the, the 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 what what has to be done and what were the failures etc maybe for the further discussion, but meanwhile I just wanted to outline what I believe are the deepest stakes in in the, in the great historical the great and complex historical moment that we're facing now in Israel. So thank you, and let's let's open the conversation, which is far more important than my introduction. Well, I want to thank you, Professor Halbertal. We have already a couple of questions in the chat box, so I'll go by the order. I'll read the first one. It's uh, from uh, Barry Lichtenberg. The right argues that unlike the US, where judges are either elected or appointed by elected officials, in Israel, they are generally appointed by fellow judges, bar association, it is, it, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Hence, giving the Knesset final say on legislation is more democratic. How would you respond? Well, the issue, uh, first of all, I would say, uh, I would say the American example of the politicization of election of judges is not a great example to follow with all due respect. We have, seen, we have seen the harm that it does to the judicial system, the total politicization, but we are not talking here 
about uh, procedures of uh, appointment of judges. And by the way, this is a very powerful question and thank you for the question. We are talking about um, the undermining, the undermining of, uh, of the power of the court to protect human rights and minority rights or, the or our obligation towards minorities by way of judicial review. And uh, uh, this is undone in the US when the court will strike down a legislation uh, being unconstitutional. The only one that can reverse it is a further court, not the legislator. The legislator cannot say, well, you think it's not constitutional? We, by the bare minority, actually overwrite your decision. And democracy is not only a majority rule. Right? Democracy is also a way of, of respecting, liberal democracy is a way of respecting minority rights, religious pluralism, and other issues. So, uh, so this, is, this is where the issue of the reform uh, of the judicial system is at stake. It's not only the, the arranging of how judges are appointed, rearranging how judges are appointed. It's something else that going, goes on, which is the emptying of the judicial system of its power as a protector of, of, of basic rights. Thank you. Next question is from uh, Esther uh, Simons, and she was asking if the previous national liberal government of Bennett Lapid failed, how can how can a future national liberal government succeed? Okay, thank you for the question, and this gives us an opportunity to address the issue of what should be done. And I want to say a few things. Some of them on the technical or immediate level and some of them in, in terms of, of, uh, of large, uh, large, more large, important, uh, long-term issues. In this election, by the way, uh, the left, the left, the center left, lost 250,000 votes uh, because two parties merits and another Arba party, Balad, ran alone, rather they joining, in the case of Meretz, the labor, the labor movement, labor party, and in the case of Balad, other Arab parties, they ran separately. They didn't, they didn't pass the threshold. Uh, and not passing the threshold meant losing um, something that is, uh, in numerically is seven seats in the Knesset. It was reckless political behavior and it caused the loss of the election. By the way, if you count the actual votes that each part passed for given, it's almost evenly split. And Netanyahu would never have a chance to form such a government with the ultra-right and the ultra-orthodox. Ultra if just for that, uh, uh, um, just for uh, avoiding this kind of reckless political behavior. So that's that's just the beginning. The country is, this is not a lost case. The country is deeply divided and the left and center left behave re recklessly. But there is another aspect. If you look at the, at the actual numbers, the, the right managed to raise levels of participation in the vote in cities that traditionally vote to, to the right, cities like Ashdod, Ashkelon, Be'er Sheva, Kriyat Shmone, other cities, there is always, a, there is an increase of 3%, 5% of votes. But if you look at the cities that traditionally represent the center, the center left, Tel Aviv, Erzaliya, Kfar Saba, Haifa, no raise in the, in, in percentage of voting. A kind of, uh, a kind of political indifference, uh, a kind of lack of political fire 
of calling upon your own voters to raise to the occasion, that needs organization, it needs charisma, it needs calling, it needs logistics, it needs hard, hard work that was not done. So uh, things are not doomed. I mean, Netanyahu, by the way, tried four times before he managed to form this, uh, this coalition. But there is a there is a, a some other long term lessons that we have to learn because the vote to the ultra right or to the right is a response to a genuine anxiety of Israelis that is not uh, by the way at the moment you deny this anxiety at the moment you you don't take this anxiety seriously. You lose this voice, vo uh, you lose a whole sector of the population for the right reasons, because you have to affirm a genuine security anxiety that people have. Uh, and the two years ago, when in the time of one of the conflicts in Gaza, where there was a, where there were clashes in the mixed cities in, in Israel. That had an immensely detrimental effect on a sense of personal security and a sense of relationship between the communities. And here, the prior government failed in creating in in creating a genuine sense of of personal and communal security. And we have to think how to restore it. The other issue, which is more important, is for us to begin to ask, what is actually the positive alternative that we are suggesting here? And it could not be rak lo bibi, just not bibi. It has to be deeper. It has to do with, uh, with uh, education, with welfare, with life with inclusion of, of, of our Arab citizens, we have to present a positive, a positive, powerful, compelling agenda that will draw the public back to an alternative which is not only negatively based on negating of the other. So these are, these are different issues that have to be addressed uh, uh, in terms of what has to be in the future and all this need a lot of thinking and serious action after thinking. So I'm combining a couple of questions because they're all on the same topic. Um, okay. There are a couple of questions that are about uh, the ultra-nationalist extremes in Israel, about uh, Avi Maoz and the Noam party uh, and his... Um, Hill, I'm sorry about, I'm trying to uh, read the word correctly. Uh, Hillinization, if I'm reading it correctly, uh, Joanne. Uh, but um, right. And also about all of the, re the relationships between um, Jews and Arab in the terms of uh, how is this form of coalition will make an impact. Okay, good. So for the first question, um, <clears throat> yes, there are elements in the ultra-right, and this is, by the way, not only in Israel. It's true in Poland, Hungary. It's appearing now in Russia, where ultra-nationalism is attached with homophobia and, uh, and a resistance to LGBT uh, movement and freedoms. That's a, that's a message that comes across very powerfully all over the ultra-right movement. And in Israel as well, in the, in, in the figure of Avi Maoz and others. And that has to do with a certain very toxic masculinity, conception of masculinity and power 
it has to do with very perverse notions of maintaining the family, the pure family. And it has to do with a confrontation, um, a, um, a, a confrontation with what they perceive as a kind of denialism of Western culture. So we are in Israel in that respect, like other phenomena, are facing that dimension of, uh, of policy of the ultra-right. I must say that in this issue, uh, that's the one of the issues that I think Netanyahu will stand firm against those tendencies is not going to allow it to become mainstream in the way they allows other things because he traditionally has taken a great pride in Israel being inclusive towards LGBT rights uh, in the past. But that's a phenomenon. Now, uh, how would that impact uh, Arab uh, and Jewish relations in Israel? Um, if we have 20% uh, Israeli citizens that are Arabs within the Green Line, the message that is given to this 20% by this government is, you'll never be able to share power. You have a right to vote, but not to right to be elected. I mean, elected to government, to be part of coalition. If you, um, if you send a message of marginalization and discrimination to a population, they will withdraw from being partners in part and slowly, we're gonna go through a process of radicalization of their own. And that could be a very destructive cycle. Now in this time, and now we have to think about future, we have to strengthen the bond, strengthen the bond, the civic bond in different parts of the segments of the civic society, not particularly uh, uh, dependent on the, on the government and politics, in institutions of education, in universities, in hospitals, in the economic sphere. We have to counter the voice by embracing our, our embracing and including our minorities when they are under, under a cloud, under a very dark cloud of marginalization. So on the one hand, what you have, as I said, a, a possible dangerous dynamic of radicalization and separation that is caused by this harsh message of marginalization that might include as well tensions around the Temple Mount Haram al-Sharif which are always a cause for a lot of unrest among, among Muslims. And, uh, and the answer to that will be that it's upon us, I mean, upon us citizens of the country, in every civic, civic sphere of social, economic, communal life, to be, to make the extra spec, spec, uh, step to strengthen the civic bond of all our citizens. So the next question, um, and once again, I'm, com I'm combining a couple of questions that are on the same topic, is dealing with Israeli and diaspora Jewry relationship. Um, how do you see the relationship, you know, moving forward? Uh, when we look at what's happening in Israel, and on the other hand, what's happening uh, here? Right. I just want to say, um, in, in continuing the last remark, election results would have been completely different in Israel if the Arab community would have voted 
in the same numbers, in the same percentage as the Jews. We have 20% of citizens of Israel are Arabs, but they have less, less than 10% Knesset members. Uh, and a very, very um, unfortunate, relatively lower participation rate than the Jews. And that also has to be changed in terms of future elections. Now, uh, the question on this result, uh, the way in which this will impact, uh, the way this will impact Israeli diaspora relations. Let me say one thing, at least I, from what I know, and maybe I'm mistaken about American Jewry, which I think I know some of it. Um, my guess is that if there will be elections among American Jews, we're gonna get the same results as in Israel. It's not, it's not a divide between Israelis and American Jews. It's a divide within the Jewish people, both in Israel and in the US. It's a deep divide. We are a divided nation in that respect. And I, I imagine as well that for progressive or for center left Jews in diaspora, it will be a reason for maybe further alienation, maybe further distance, which I as a Jew and Israeli will feel very, very saddened by that because it's not the time for alienation. It's the time for struggle. And in Syria, it's the time for further more intense engagement with the things people believe in. And by the way, one thing that I see, which is I'm very worried about coming to the country and talking to students and friends, is a, a, a kind of a withdrawal, despair, a kind of internal exile, a sense of defeat, And uh, it's too early to surrender. Not only that, surrender is self-fulfilling. And uh, I would say that this, given the stakes, given what's at stake in this issue, this is a moment for far more intense, acute engagement with the things that you, other people believe in, on what Israel, the way Israel should go, the way it will shape itself. And uh, given that Israel is so divided, you have partners, you have partners in this country, and you have to seek the partnership with them in terms of the way to help them and to help them. So I have two questions that I'm combining. It's from Nancy Kaplan. Both of them are about Netanyahu and actually President Herzog. So the first one uh, deals with, he's considered to be a very caution politician and I'm making it shorter, but uh, he's, uh, Netanyahu is considered to be a very caution politician. How can you explain his uh, radical moves with uh, joining forces in, uh, with the extreme right? And the second question is about President Herzog and uh, extending, giving him an extension on forming the coalition. Do you really think uh, that Herzog uh, will give him the extension? And if not, what can happen? Well, let's start with the first easy question, I think. <laughs> These are good questions. Herzog will give him an extension. Uh, he has to give him an extension. 
uh, and uh, that that won't be an issue. I mean, there's a, there's some call for him not to give himself, but the, but but the coalition conversations are so advanced that if Herzog is not going to give him an extension, it will look like um, almost a presidential a presidential undermining of an electoral process on the part of Herzog is not going to do that. So we don't have to think about the question, what will happen if he does it? I don't think he's going to do it. Now, Netanyahu himself, well, he's, I, I'm not, I must say, I'm interested in the question and to a certain degree, uh, uh, I'm not sure I know fully how to answer. I have, you know, different psychological speculations. Um, Netanyahu is a politician and he wants to survive in power and he might want to survive in power for other reasons. He's in the midst of a, a very complex judicial process. But also I think, I believe, uh, I believe that he thinks that uh, given uh, his geopolitical contribution, experience, given the, the Iranian challenge. He can, he is so important, the, the, his being in power is so important for the future of Israel that uh, he can, you know, he can cut corners, compromise, do things that maybe he's not feeling completely comfortable with, but the trade-off for him is much more important. Well, what I would say is riding on a tiger, they're gonna swallow him. That this is a very, very dangerous moment. It's not just mere give and take, creating compromises with people you're not sure you wanna create compromises. It's such a cultural, spiritual, ethical moment, which is not, I think, not fully perceived by him because he thinks, I, I imagine that he thinks two things. First of all, that he, that, that him and the could being in power is more important than whatever other things that are compromised with. And also that he'll manage it. You know, he will have, he has the skill, et cetera, et cetera, to manage it. Uh, but as he goes along, he has legitimizes the most dark forces in Israeli life. And I'm not sure it's worth whatever calculations that he has. I'm not sure it's worth it. Not only that I'm not sure it's worth it, I, I believe it's really not worth it. But these are just guesses about what's going on in the heart and mind of Netanyahu, who is a gifted man. And he has, I think he cares. There is an element in him of genuine care about the, the, the future of Israel and the country. And I know also that people in power have the, how would I say gently, have a way of um, com very complex processes of self-deception that are engaged in the gap between motivations and justifications that are inherent into political life. So just because of a uh, matter of time, I'll, leave, I'll have two more questions. The first one, um, it's it's a big, big, so I'm gonna I'm gonna put it. Uh, it's all about the Israeli Arabs. So the first part is the Israeli Arabs are twenty percent of the overall population of the state of Israel, but they are only ten percent of all seats in the Knesset. Uh, do you think that the left, the center left uh, Jewish uh, parties? can help rise the numbers. That's one. The second thing is, uh, why do you think the Arab parties didn't join forces and ran as a, as a joint list like they did in the past? 
Uh, do you think they underestimate themselves? And the third part is also about the Israeli Arabs, but it concerns with the uh, with the Arab riots of um, in May of 2021. What do you think was the impact uh, on the Arab society? In uh... right. So uh, so let's for the first question is I think that that it's, it is the it is upon the Arab our Arab minority to do their cheshbon nefesh, to do their soul searching of what does it mean for them and for the country. To disengage from political, full political participation. Again, and the numbers that are pointed in the question you raised are striking. If they would have just voted the way the, the Jews vote, there is no way that we're gonna have a Bengvir or Smotrich in the government. No way. And it is the luxury of indifference and victimhood that drives people to that position. So it's upon them to do the soul searching and it depends others to say in what way we can be of help in raising levels of political participation. Now about the split in the, in the Arab parties. Uh, it's a matter of political ego. You know, at the end, it's personal relationship, this one, that one. The debate was about number six in the list. And by the way, let's look at merits and labor. Why didn't they join? This is the narcissism of small differences put large. Why didn't they join? It was so reckless in such an important moment. And by the way, you didn't need to be a genius. It's a very risky endeavor to run separately. So it is where personal matters of, of ego, of insult, a certain sense of overblown conception of your strength that drives politicians to make mistakes that are very costly. And this was one of them. What is the impact of the riots? The third element of the questions. It is, it, it brought, uh, by the way, it had an immense impact on the Jewish border. And uh, I, I, I must say, if you are a resident, if you live in the South, in Omer, or Be'er Sheva, et cetera, et cetera, and you're afraid that your kid or yourself driving at the, at the roads of the Negev is insecure, that will, that will lead to naturally to a certain type, a type of voting pattern that it was the responsibility of the government to provide a sense of security to all communities and individuals. It's the primary responsibility. And by the way, the riots, uh, the, 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 if you look at the riots from the perspective of, of the Arab population, it included two things. It included a fear, some of it a result of very malicious propaganda, that the Jews are there to go and, and take, take this, the Temple Mount. It's like, it's like the Jews were playing, the radical Jews were playing with matches next to a gasoline tank provided by the Islamic radicals in this, in, among the Israeli and other parts, which created this combustion situation. And also it was an expression, a, a very hard expression, violent expression of a sense of, of discrimination and, 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 and marginalization of years. And that has, and what's, what's 
complex about it, we have to remember that if you look at the Arab vote, half of them, with all the complexities, half of the vote went to Mansour Abbas, who declared ahead of time, I want participation and integration, and I want to be part, and he got half of the Arab vote. It's an, also an interesting result. So, um, so that's what I can say in short about the, the Arab-Israeli condition. So the last question, just because our time is almost up and we want to respect your time. Uh, um, so the question goes for the Israelis. Do they really care about, you know, uh, diaspora Jewry and American Jewry? Um, or because Netanyahu comes to the US and in English, he lies to Americans and he walks the walk, he, he talks the talk, but he doesn't walk the walk. Do Israelis really care about uh, American Jewry and the connection between them? I think the category of it's such a painful and complex question. So let me start with the fact that the category of Israelis is not a is not a category. There are many, there are many different Israelis. And as I say, Israel is a divided country. I'm also an Israeli, right. no less than Netanyahu, right? I care. I know many people who care. And we care because we share in a faith. We share in historical faith. And we also, I believe deep there, we are in need of one another. And I think without the loss, with the loss of that tie, and we love that caring, Israel will stop being a Jewish state in any serious way. Uh, because Israel ultimately is an expression of, uh, of the unfolding of Jewish history as a whole. So um, the answer is that there are different types of Israelis and different kinds of Israelis, that Israelis are deeply divided. And I think Netanyahu in particular, one of the wrongs that, that grew out of his policy is um, making Israel a partisan issue in the US, which I think was in terms of the future of Israel, I'm talking now about geopolitics. It, we're gonna pay a price for it, uh, strategically, geopolitically, because Israel should not be a partisan issue in the US. And we should strive for a broader support that is based on sharing of values rather than making Israel a partisan case. Now, Naturally, if you make Israel a partisan case, you will care about those elements in American Jewry who are in the so-called right party. So one of the sad outcomes of making Israel a partisan case in the US is breaking ties with deep ties with major elements of Jewish life who are not Republicans, who never be Republicans, and yet they care, they think, they, they're natural supporters and committed to Israel. And that's, I would say, um, a very, very sad and problematic collateral harm done by this political outlook. Again, it's not an Israeli outlook. I don't think that was the outlook of Lapid or Bennett or other Israelis. It's a particular voice in Israel. And, and uh, it's a voice that has to be faced and, and struggled with. Oh. As you, if I get everything you say, there is always hope. 
<laughs> and we shouldn't lose it. Look, I want to say one thing. Of course. Uh, uh, first of all, thank you for the questions and uh, and the interest and your caring and your invitation. And I know, I know what you do and all of you and and Felicia and Rolly and others in your leadership. Um, you know, we we grew up. I grew up, and I think many of us grew up as children of of generation of Jews. We suffered tremendously in the previous century. And I think I think of the shame. My father is passed away, and my father was a survivor. And the shame that I will have facing him, declaring a surrender now without hope, given the resilience, the struggle of that generation. It's not only him, it's the whole generation. So um, yeah, let's keep hope because, uh, because we have, we have, we have a divided country and divided with, uh, with internal resources to draw on. And uh, one thing that I worry the most is um, is political despair. I, look, I want to say one thing. This is also an American experience. I mean, in some ways, America is also fighting for its soul. And uh, and you see, you know, you see the movement. I guess you had just a good result yesterday, right? Mm -hmm. um, you see the movement and you see uh, what's at stake and you see the hard work that has to be done in, uh, in mobilizing people, in creating leadership, in com convincing people that you care for them and you have the right plans and you have a, a road to the future. So yes. If we just, if, if I have contributed slightly to a sense of hope without sugarcoating the reality, I have done my little mitzvah of the day. 